This video is part three of a series where I intend to gather some wild clay, make a pot, fire it to earthenware in a wood fire, then use it as a cooking vessel to prepare a meal again in a wood fire. In this part, I'm firing the pots. Before we get to firing, let's just review the pots, including a little bit of finishing that's happened since part two. The raw, unrefined clay pot is completely dry now, as are the large and small pots I made from sand-tempered clay. The little bowl I made from shell-grogged clay feels really hard and solid, again, almost like a piece of fired pottery already. I've burnished the inside of this as best I can. The small lamp that I made, also from sand-tempered clay, is a bit rough and lumpy, so I decided to sand it smooth by rubbing it with a rough pebble. Anyway, after a bit of rubbing with this limestone pebble, sandpaper would also have worked, I smoothed out the shape to more or less where I wanted it, and then I moistened the surface and burnished it by rubbing it with this polished pebble. I spent quite a lot of time on that, and the result is really quite pleasing. It looks almost like a fired piece of pottery already. I hope it keeps this finish when it's fired. The medium-sized pot I made from purified clay is intact after drying. I dried it under paper to slow things down and mitigate any stresses that might come from uneven drying. And Steph's two wonky pots are also dry. A tall dice tumbler made from shell-grogged clay, and this pinch pot which she deliberately deformed into this shape, which reminds me of something, but I can't quite think what. Oh, and I made a die from the scraps of shell-grogged clay that I scraped when I was shaping the pedestal on the bowl. I think I'll have to fire this inside one of the other pots so I don't just lose it in the ashes. So these are my pots that are ready for firing, and just before we go, I'll tease you with a glimpse of this covered dish, which is something quite different that spun off this process, and since it's not dry enough yet, this is going to get its own episode later in this series. I had interestingly mixed feelings on the way to firing the pots. I've invested a lot of time and effort making these things, and some of them are really nice. The next part might destroy them all. Part of me wanted to say, can't we just stop here? It would be safer. Except it won't be complete. In order to progress, we have to accept the possibility that the next step in the process might be a painful one. Off to my friend's Stephen Julia's orchard where there's enough space to make a proper fire. I dug a shallow pit and inside of it built a fire, mostly out of coppiced hazel that's been dried under cover. I let this burn and while it was burning, I made a little raft of sticks and arranged the pots on it next to the fire. The stick raft is to keep them out of contact with the soil, which is damp and while they're here by the fire, the idea is they will heat up, driving off any last traces of moisture, and also so that they won't experience quite so much thermal shock when they finally go into the fire. When the primary fire had burned down mostly, I raked the embers to the side and made a raft of small logs at the bottom of the pit with air gaps in between and a little space below. I arranged the pots on this and then began building the fire again over the top of them, trying not to put anything big and heavy on top of any pot or in a position where it might fall heavily as it burns. The idea here is to get the fire fully built before it catches, then get it going so it all heats up as evenly as possible. The fire burned quite vigorously for about 45 minutes. At times I carefully added a few more bits of wood, and now and then I could see glimpses of my pots through the flames. As it burned down I prepared a stew, I cut up some vegetables and some cabanossi. I know you're not meant to use this sausage in this way, but it turns out it's not illegal to do that. I added some spices, herbs and salt and a bit of water, put the lid on and nestled the pan down in the edge of the fire. There were some popping noises in the fire, but I think that was just flint pebbles in the underlying soil cracking, and sometimes bits of wood popping and crackling as it burned. After it had been burning for about an hour and a half, the embers started to collapse and the two larger pots were revealed. It's very clear at this point that a transformation has taken place. The surface of the pots is a sort of brick red. I left the fire for a moment and got some nice fresh stinging nettle tops from the hazel coppice. I was a bit concerned about the exposed parts cooling too quickly while the rest of the pot was still hot inside the fire, so I added a few more pieces of wood to try to keep it hot. I'm not sure if that made any difference, actually the entire area was really hot. I had to wear heatproof gloves in order to have my hand anywhere in the vicinity for more than a moment. I left things in there for a total of about three hours, which gave me time to enjoy my stew. At this point I was thinking about what I might eventually cook in my clay pots if they survive firing. Eventually the embers died right down and I began pulling out some of the pots. The burnished dish made from shell grogged clay first, it was still very hot so I dropped it into a pile of dry leaves. Sort of like the raku method although I hadn't planned this and it's probably best done when the pots are hotter than this one is. As time went on I pulled the other small pots out. All of the smaller pieces seemed to have fired successfully, even the medium sized pot that I made from purified clay with no temper in it, which is a surprise, this is the one I thought would probably break. However, cracks were visible on the raw clay pot, and as it turned out, on the large sand-tempered pot too. I had expected some failures all along. They say to expect 40%, so 
So if that's 40% by count, we're doing well. If it's 40% by mass, we're not doing so well. After everything had cooled for another hour, I could handle it all. All of the smaller pieces had a nice ceramic ring or tink to them. I think these are all fine, including Steph's wonky pots. The shell grog clay bowl has some beautiful patterning and markings, and the little lamp, which was right in the middle of the hottest part of the fire, has come out with a sort of metallic sheen to it, very pronounced on the bottom. I think this piece might have accidentally undergone a reduction firing when it was buried in the ashes, where a shortage of oxygen leads to a different surface colour and patina as the combustion steals oxygen from the clay. The shine is from the burnishing I gave it, but the colour and patina is from the chemistry of the firing. This part here was a genuine high point. Even though we're not all the way done on this project, it was supremely satisfying to handle this piece of pottery. Crude and dirty though it is, this is actual magic. I've taken soil and transformed it into a solid, durable object. Of course, I'm not the first to do this, but this is a magical process, and you really have to do this to feel that magic. So these two big pots are both failures, a big crack in the base of the raw clay pot and a network of cracks in one side of the large sand-tempered pot. When they were completely cool, I took them home and gave them all a wash and scrub. The two large pots broke into pieces as I was handling them. I'm especially happy with the oil lamp. I couldn't resist giving it a try. A little roll of cotton fabric in there as a wick, about a tablespoon of olive oil, wait for that to soak up into the wick, light it, and there we are. It's a functional lamp. It burns with a nice steady flame, the light is less bright than a candle, but it would be enough to see your way around a darkened house. I left it burning on a metal dish for safety, and it burns for several hours on just one tablespoon of oil. So the lamp is a success. It's a shame that wasn't the key objective of this project. Anyway, back to those pots. What went wrong? It's not the clay, at least not with the sand-tempered clay, because the lamp and several of the small pots are made from the same stuff, so the clay is okay. Now, the raw clay might be the reason the other pot cracked, Looking inside the broken pieces, there are bits of grit in there, and if those are pieces of flint, they may well have popped or expanded suddenly when heated. But the two pieces that failed have a few factors in common, apart from their larger general size, that is. They both have thicker walls than the other pieces. This might mean that they did not heat up or cool down evenly enough. So the outside skin, for example, might be fired ceramic, while the inner sections are still undergoing firing. They were both placed upside down in the fire, which might have affected the way they heated up. Maybe the inside got hotter faster than the outside, or vice versa. An examination of the interior of the broken pieces does suggest that maybe they didn't fire evenly or completely. In many places, the pottery is a sort of pale grey colour inside, with a very thin layer of red brick ceramic on the outside. They were both partly exposed as the embers died down, so it's possible they fired OK, but differential cooling cracked them at the end of the process. So at the end of part three, I don't have a pot large enough to use for cooking, so we can't progress to that stage next, but I'm not giving up. I have plenty more clay, and I might try grinding up one of these failed firings and using some of that to grog another batch of clay. I understand that can help with stability. I will make some more pots and try again. I'm purposely gonna leave a couple of weeks between this episode and the next one though, because I anticipate there'll be a lot of suggestions and feedback about the success and failure. Some of your suggestions I might try out. I can't promise to try them all though because of limitations of time and materials. I hope this has been interesting so far. We're not remotely done yet, so thanks for watching and I hope to see you again soon.